I'm based in London. Um, ah. one of the th yeah, one of the things about all the lockdown is the conferences are all kind of moving online. So it's nice because yeah. in a way, it's much more accessible, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. exactly, yes. Now we have speakers around the region, around the world. It's really vibrant. Oh. Yeah. Yes, I'm blessing in this, guys. <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. course, kind of. you, never, you never can beat actually meeting together in person. Uh, yes. But as far as the, yeah, looking at the plus sides... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how's the how's the um, the Singapore Go meetup going? When did it when did it start? Uh it started many years back. I wasn't the uh, the, the the person who started it. It started with uh, Audrey Lim and uh, and Don, who's uh, both uh, working overseas now. So so the team. This is a new team. We took over around two years, one and a half years back. Yeah. yeah so it's been. Um, we try to do this every two months. But with online, I think we can do it every month now. That's really good. Uh, um, accessibility to speakers was one of the key issues, but I guess with this yeah. online format, it's, it's much easier. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. And thank you for also uh, coming and talk and share with the community. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm honored to be asked. I'm pleased to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, the situation there in London? No? Mm. Sorry? For the, uh, how's the situation there in London for... Oh, for the lockdown? Yes. Um, well, actually, it's they're not dealing with it brilliantly, so they're kind of opening up a lot now, and it's okay. a little premature, yeah. So um, I think, yeah, we'll see. We're going to probably see uh, another spike. Um, okay. Yeah, probably, okay. uh, and and some people find it very difficult to follow the rules. So, uh, ah. like the beaches, we have beaches <laughs> here, believe it or not. I learned this the other day because it was on the news, and all the people are on the beach, okay. um, which they shouldn't be. But you know, they look like they're having a great time. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, sorry, go on. Yeah, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, I'm just staying out of the way. Yeah. I already stayed in anyway. I was already on lockdown for like 12 years by <laughs> just being a programmer. Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah. Didn't change much for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but some people used to go outside, and for them, <clears throat> much more difficult. That's I would still like to have an option, though. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Now you can't go. Now I'm like, ah, oh, should have, should have gone outside before when it was allowed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I don't know. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully we can. Science will save us. I think. Hopefully, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. So uh, we'll get yeah. some science on it and then get, yeah. get a vaccine. Yeah. True. Hmm. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, back here we're not really back to normal yet, but uh, yeah, it's uh, getting better. So. I've been going out yeah. in case we cannot go out again. So, so yeah. <laughs> we can have bubble teas again. Yeah. And do you wear masks? Is is it yes. commonplace there? Yeah. So that's the one problem yeah. we're having is socially it's awkward to wear masks for some reason. So mm -hmm. um, there's a reluctance for people to just wear masks, even though there is a clear kind of benefit to doing it. Yeah. Um, uh. That's another one. Yeah, we're seeing some interesting kind of cultural differences as well. It's, I, I, I wouldn't have thought people would care here, but um, yeah, there, for some reason there's a reluctance to wear the masks. I think they look good. I think we should all wear yeah. them anyway. It's, it's not common to wear masks in Singapore either. Uh, yeah. So there, there were some resistance originally, but uh, I think most people told the line because it's right. mandated, so everyone needs to wear the mask. Otherwise, you'd be fine. Uh, so I think everyone sort of uh, told the line after a while. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's the thing; it isn't mandated here. I think on public transport now you do have to, but um, there, there's a very relaxed approach in this mm. with the, from the government here. So it's it's quite strange. We'll see. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Well. Yeah. Okay. Shall we start? Um, yeah. Shall we start? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the De Google Developer Space channel. And thank you for tuning in to the live stream today. So do make use of the live chat, uh, whether you are tuning in on YouTube or Facebook to ask questions, and we will get to, to them at the end of every speaker session. So before we begin, let me briefly introduce what we do and who we are. Google Developer Space is a platform for developers and startups from around the region to learn, connect, engage, and be inspired. As part of the developer relations team, we aim to empower and connect the community to our people, programs, network, and technologies, be it in person, like a few months ago, or online, like today. So for today's session, we are very excited to be hosting Go Singapore, led by Take Chun. Thanks, Take Chun, for bringing such a great line of speakers. Without further ado, I'll hand the stage over to Go Singapore to start today's session. Over to you, Take Chun and Sien Yi. Hi, hi, thank you, Jia Xing, and thank you, uh, Google Dev Spaces, for hosting us uh, and giving us a platform to have this live streaming. And uh, I know it's a Saturday evening. Thank you for tuning in and uh, not going to and not going for socialize. I know it's phase two now. Um, <laughs> Uh, today we have two speakers, uh, and uh, uh, let me briefly introduce them. Um, first speaker, Tao Shong, uh, he's a CEO of SP Digital. Today he's going to talk about goal-based framework for building simulations. And speaker will be Matt. He's going to give us a technical tour of uh, Pace.dev codebase and the entire goal stack. So um, without further ado, um, let's uh, begin. Um, first we have Tao Shong will take us through his first talk. Um, we welcome all comments and questions along the way, um, but we we will see how it goes and we can take that at the end of the session. i go over to you, Sao Shou. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in to this session in uh, on a Saturday evening. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about Patrick, basically, which is the uh, Go framework that uh, are used to do simulations. Uh, essentially, it's a cellular automator framework. Uh, so uh, this is the first time I'm doing this presentation, um, but I actually have this on a uh, blog post uh, as well. So if you are interested in this, you can always go to the blog post and uh, follow it up. Or you know, if you can't follow what I'm saying here, uh, maybe you can actually do better on, on the blog post. Okay, so uh, let me start. Right, so cellular automator. I guess most people, if you are uh, from a com science background, you will probably have uh, encountered cellular automator in the past. Um, so automator is the uh, plural of automaton, um, which essentially means it's a machine that can act independently. So uh, essentially, if you look at uh, today's legal, it's uh, what people would normally call an agent. Right? Uh, it's an autonomous agent. Um, but cellular automator is kind of interesting because uh, it's based on a simulation that's uh, a grid. So it has a grid of cells. It has been invented a long, long time ago by some of the luminaries of our industry, uh, Stanislaw Eula and uh, John von Neumann. So uh, for those who would know, a little bit of the history of, uh, of computing and, and programming, right? You know, these are some of the pioneers in our space. Um, so one of the more popular uses of, or, or more popular uh, way that people actually interact with uh, cellular automator is this uh, uh, thing called the game of life, right? That's uh, basically a simulation. Um, we start off as a mathematical puzzle uh, that's based on cellular automator. Invented by uh, this uh, mathematician slash programmer called John Conway. Uh, very unfortunately, he passed away recently, a couple of months ago. Uh, but uh, this is one of his uh, greatest legacies, and uh, was first published in his uh, in Martin Gardner's uh, Mathematical Games column in the uh, very famous Scientific American magazine. I'm not sure how many. You actually read Scientific American anymore, but uh, it is actually a, a pretty amazing uh, magazine. And Mathematical Games is also a very uh, popular column uh, at one point in time. Um, so, what is Game of Life? 
So Gear Alive is a simulation that's done within a uh, grid of cells, um, a cellular automator. Uh, it has a few rules. So the first rule is that any live cell that has less than two live neighbors will, will die. And the uh, second rule is that uh, any live cell with more than three live neighbors will also die. Right? But if you happen to have exactly two or three live neighbors, then you'll live on to the next generation. And if you have exactly three live neighbors, uh, you would you would regenerate and you would come back alive, right? So, what do you mean by neighbors? So we look at uh, this particular uh, grid of nine cells. Imagine that you are the cell right in the center. Then your neighbors are basically the eight cells that are surrounding you, right? So this is uh, uh, the game of life rules, and uh, this is how the, the, the game. Uh, works. So um, I used to do a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I still do, I do actually do a lot of uh, simulation. And uh, one of the kind of simulations that I, I really like to do is a, a cellular automator simulations. Um, and I've done a, a number of them. And uh, a few months back, I was thinking that I've done so many of them. Uh, why don't I just, you know, create a framework to, to allow myself to do this a uh, lot more effectively and uh, to just sort of uh, use the same framework over and over again, right? Essentially, you'll be using my same, the same code that I, I, I do for uh, some of these simulations. So what I did was um, to create this uh, framework called Petri. And uh, it's essentially a Go-based cellular automator framework. And uh, it focuses on building grid-based simulations. Uh, the default implementation is a game of life simulation. So uh, this is a screenshot, or rather, this is a GIF of a uh, some of, of one of the uh, simulations I ran, and this is something that you will see exactly. So how does it work? Um, the basic implementation is, is very very simple. Um, basically, you create an instance of uh, the default implementation, and you use the, the run function to run it. And, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, if you want to customize further though, then you need to do uh, a little bit more. So first of all, you need to implement the simulator interface. Uh, simulator is a representation of the simulation. Uh, and the two most important methods in this interface are the init method and the uh, process method. Uh, the rest of it, you can again, then again, fall back on the default implementation. It is quite kind of self-explanatory, uh, so I won't really go through each one of these pros, uh, each one of these uh, methods. But uh, I just want to talk a little bit more about the two most important uh, methods, which is init and process. So the init method, it's the name says it all, right? It uh, calls before the simulation starts. It initializes the simulation. Um, and the most basic thing you need to do is really just to populate the grid because you need the grid to be populated before you start the simulation. And init does exactly that. Um, the process method uh, is called every generation of the simulation. So uh, at every iteration, uh, something happens and uh, basically you run this method every generation. And this is normally where all the main logic and rules reside. So the process is where the bulk of your logic will reside. So obviously, you can use that as a launch pad to call the other logic that you have. But uh, if you're doing a relatively simple simulation, then uh, mostly everything will be inside it. OK, so that's a very quick description of what Petri is. It's actually quite simple. Let me quickly jump into uh, the code itself. So uh, let me go full screen on this guy. Full screen. OK, so uh, let me go to the basic. Right, so this is it. This is all the code there is. And um, if I switch over to the uh, let me try to find where it is. Uh -huh, here it is. Okay. Let me open up a little bit. Okay. 
you can see my terminal here. This is basically the code. And uh, I will build this. And then I will uh, call basic. Right. So um, when I call it, you can see the simulation running. Um, the simulation basically runs on a web server, uh, which is that's part of the simulation. And uh, yeah, this simulation doesn't really do much because it just, just ends really quickly. Uh, but you can always keep running. You can uh, run it over and over again. And uh, sometimes it does something a little bit more interesting, like uh, what is happening here now. Like, so the basic simulation is, is just a game of life. Um, very simple. If you want to show a game of life and you want this thing to just go on forever, you can just turn this on and, and there you go. Right. So nothing very fancy. Um, I'll keep this running and see what happens uh, later. OK, let me get back to the slides. So that's the uh, very basic simulation with nothing really much. Uh, so there's this thing called a gospel's gun. Essentially, it is a game of life, uh, but it simulates a gun. And uh, this is a schematic of the gun itself. right? So you look carefully at this guy. And let me quickly get back into the code. So that's gun. That's the gun code. Let me uh, go and show you the code itself. A little bit more involved now. So you look here, The uh, essentially, this part is still the same. If you look at the simulation, um, if I create a simulation, uh, what simulation is this? So this is this is this one. I create my sim, uh, which has this anonymous variable Petri sim, and uh, I overwrite the default sims in it method. I don't overwrite the process method because I the process method in the uh, default implementation is game of life. So I'm going to reuse that. So I'm not going to overwrite it. Um, but what in it does is basically it will create a gun and the gun uh, is the, the pattern of the gun is this one uh, if you go back to the slides again uh, essentially that's um, that's where is, it, where is my slides uh, essentially is this guy okay so let me stop the uh, simulation the previous simulation okay just show this to you. Okay. Uh, go build. I already built it, but I'm, I'm going to just run it again just to show that it's actually running. So this is the gun. Right, so this is Gospel's gun. Uh, and this is the uh, simulation using Game of Life. Right. So it's, it's actually quite simple. Nothing really very uh, complicated about this, but that's the beauty of uh, cellular automator. Uh, you can actually create quite a lot of very interesting things. There's a whole ton of very, very fascinating uh, things you can do with just the game of life with uh, different starting points of the pattern. OK, let me just stop this and get back to the, uh, the slides. Uh, go. OK. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, this thing called elementary cellular automator. Um, in 2002, Stephen Wolfram, um, so you, you probably know him, he created the uh, uh, Mathematica. He also created the uh, programming language. Uh, in 2002, he wrote this really gigantic book, uh, 1,000 over pages uh, book called A New Kind of Science. and uh, it has a lot of his ideas in it, which, uh, and uh, the main part of the idea is something that he called the elementary cellular automator. So it is cellular automator, uh, but on a, on a very elementary basis. And he believes, Wolfram believes, that the world can be explored uh, if you use experiments in simulations built using these elementary cellular automator. Right. It is quite a controversial. Um, quite a controversial book when it first came out. And I think today is still uh, a little bit controversial. Uh, it has been almost 20 years, and he has uh, republished a new kind of science. It's actually available for free online. So if you're interested, you can check it out. 
it's really thick book though. Um, without going to the controversy, let me just describe what elementary cellular automator is and uh, how Petri can be used to also implement it. So what is elementary cellular automator? It um, refers to the most basic kind of uh, cellular automator. It's basically a 1D CA, right? Uh, what do you mean by 1D? So basically it's just a line of a line of cells, like a, a grid with all of these boxes. Um, how do you simulate it? So it's exactly the same way as we had previously. Uh, the rules of the CA depends on its neighbors. So if you remember earlier on our uh, rules for the 2D CA, basically we have uh, the uh, cell and it's influenced by neighbors, the eight neighbors that surround it. Here, you only have two neighbors. Basically, you have the left and the right. So imagine here again, if you are the center guy here, uh, your two neighbors are the one to your left and uh, to your right. right? And uh, this particular pattern here, 001, will influence the next generation, uh, what is going to be here, like the question mark here. So um, you can imagine that uh, this three, this three uh, uh, numbers, this three uh, uh, binary numbers, then will be uh, the the thing that determines what happens to this particular cell. And you can determine a set of rules that uh, try to figure out what this uh, cell state is going to be at the next generation. So. It can be many things, but let's assume this set of rules, right? So if you say one, 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 it will become zero, one, one, zero, become one, so on, so on. So this is arbitrary. Uh, this is the set of rules that say I, I put it, right? So, so in this case, if you look previously uh, at that sing single or one B C A, so zero, zero, one, uh, and if you look here, zero, zero, one, where is it? Zero, zero, one. The next state will be a one. So you see here, the next state will be a one. Okay. So that's in essence what a one D C A is, a one D cellular automator is. Uh, so how can we use Petri to do this, and uh, how does it translate uh, to a two D world? So converting into a two D C A, just as normal any other C A. Uh, if you place the next generations of the 1D CA below its previous generation, it's essentially something that you get. You get something like this. Yeah. Uh, this pattern is called a Spursinsky, Sir, Sir Spinsky triangle, and uh, it's created using the rules that I just defined earlier on. Okay, this uh, elementary CA rules, uh, the one that I show you just now. Uh, which is one zero one one zero one zero, which if we quickly go back here, right? So one zero one one zero one zero. If you look at this number, is basically the base two equivalent of base ten ninety. So this particular rule is also known as uh, rule ninety. And since there are a maximum of eight bits to the power three. Uh, uh, number of rule sets because you only have like uh, three bits the, your left neighbor your right neighbor and yourself uh, so the maximum number of rule sets for an elementary cellular automate is basically 26 but this 26 you can you can see a huge variety of them so for example this is rule 90 if you run uh, this is run using uh, Patrick yeah, this is rule 110 uh, this is rule 30 Okay, so let me quickly try to uh, jump into a demo. Okay, so let's see. Uh, oops. Oh, I forgot to show you the, the code. Sorry. Code. 
So here, um, again, I call it my sim. Just can't think of a better name. Like uh, you have a anonymous variable, Patrick sim. You, I overwrite the default sims uh, init method, and uh, I also overwrite the uh, process method as well. Right. So this is the code. Uh, I won't go through each uh, part of the code. It's actually not very complicated. Just uh, slightly a bit more mathematics than the previous one. And um, the important thing is, is for example, here I uh, allow a setting of a parameter. Right. So the uh, the rules here. So if I use the uh, This guy, rule, let's say 90, let's start at uh, 80. Right, so you see this is uh, how you end. Um, of course, you can make this a lot bigger. So let me try to make it a lot bigger. I just actually, I forgot the, uh, uh, what was the, flag for that uh, the width. so my my default width is um, 36 let me try to make it a 60 cell right, so this becomes like this it's because I'm starting at 18 so 60 if I start right in the middle it should be 30 so we go start again at 30 So you see the simulation, this is, this is how it looks like. Uh, let's go look at a different rule. It can take a while, so because it uh, every every line is basically a, a new generation. Let's take at rule uh, one one two. Right, so uh, this is how it looks like. So if you're interested in uh, a new kind of science, you're interested in uh, what Stephen Bertram uh, is saying and you really think he's, he's right, you want to play around with it, you can always take a look at Petri and uh, see how you can implement or follow up some of his, uh, his the things that he said. OK, so the code is quite simple. Uh, oh, sorry, not this one. The code is quite simple. Uh, it's all here. It's, just like less than 100 lines of code, uh, play around with it, muck around with it. OK, so this is the uh, um, cellular automator. And uh, this is essentially the, the basic forms of Petri. Uh, let me go into something slightly different now. It's uh, not exactly, it is still cellular automator, but uh, I am looking at a different kind of simulation. Right. Um, this at one point in time was actually quite uh, well known, but in any case, uh, in 2009, this cartographer, uh, his name is Bill Rankin, he came out with uh, quite a quite an interesting map that shows how racially segregated Chicago is. Like, so if you look at the map to the right, uh, you can see like the white people in, in Chicago, the or the uh, uh, magenta colored ones then the black people are the one in blue. And you can tell very clearly, it's, it's very, very straight. Like, look, this line here basically demarcates where the white people stays and uh, where the, the, the black people stays, right? And, uh, and you look at the Hispanics, they also occupy certain lines here. There's a line here uh, and that really cuts through where the black and the Hispanics live. Right? So it's, it's quite startling. And so after this map came out, uh, Quite a few other cartographers and, and people look. Hey, you know, can I can I create similar maps of other cities in the U.S. And so they did. And uh, not surprisingly, you can see many of the cities also behave the same way. But you look at Detroit, for example. Uh, these are the, the whites that are in red, and uh, the blacks are in blue. It's uh, almost a straight line right across here. It's pretty pretty. Uh, mind-boggling to see this kind of uh, segregation. And um, is it only in US? And actually, no. Uh, somebody did the same thing 
for London as well. Uh, this is actually an interactive map, but uh, I took it out, took a snapshot and, and pasted it here. And uh, for the most multicultural city in the world, Toronto, uh, somebody did that as well. And you can see also, while it is not as, as uh, clearly segregated as some of the cities in in US, you can still see that a big part of uh, certain people, certain uh, ethnicities really live in certain areas and others live in other areas. It's quite clear. They are quite clearly demarcated and segregated, uh, even for the most multicultural city in the world. Right? Um, back to the simulation. So in 1971, this gentleman called Thomas Schelling, uh, who is a pretty famous economist, uh, American economist, he wrote this paper on racial segregation called uh, Dynamic Models of Segregation. And in this paper, he described a model to demonstrate how racial segregation can easily come about um, without actually, without, uh, without actually some somebody doing uh, a lot of things about it, right? and uh, the way that he did it was, was actually pretty straightforward. He only used two races, uh, the black and the white, and uh, he used a hash and a zero, and uh, basically every iteration of this grid, uh, he would use. He would actually generate this uh, on a, uh, a, a piece of paper, right, and then he would generate it from uh, one generation to another generation on, on paper. Um, so the rules are quite simple. Uh, everyone has a place at any point in time. So uh, they, I can't remember which is which, but uh, one race will be the hash, the other one will be the zero. And at any one point in time, they would have a place. And the next generation, he's, he or she is uh, free to move to any other space that is empty. Uh, you control the simulation using a few parameters. The, the neighborhood size, for example. Uh, the second is the demanded percentage of one's own race. Uh, basically, how many of your neighbors are of the same race as you are. Then the ratio of uh, the, the, the two different races, which is the black and the white in the whole population. Uh, as in, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the uh, number of people who live, uh, uh, the number of, uh, of people in a particular race who is on this map. Uh, then the other rule is the uh, rule, particular rule that governs the movement of people. In Shannon's case, he uh, modeled it in such a way that uh, you cannot move too far away from where you, you uh, come from. So that was a rule. And finally, the number of vacancies. So obviously, if you have uh, no vacancies on the map, then you can't really, or on, on the grid, then you can't really move anywhere else. So I, what I did was uh, I rebuilt Schelling's model using Petri, and uh, I changed some of the parameters. Uh, but most of them are the same. The, I think the, the major thing that is different for me is that I did not actually limit the, the, uh, how far somebody can go in terms of moving around uh, the grid. Uh, uh, and I we sort of enlarged his simulation as well. So Schelling only had two, the black and the white, because I think it's kind of hard to do more uh, on paper. Uh, obviously, I didn't do on paper. I did on a computer, so I enabled uh, any number of races. So of course, if you have too many, then it, it actually becomes too difficult to see. Um, in the example, or rather the, the image, the GIF that I have on the right, you can see that there are three races. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the parameters are the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a demo of uh, how this works. Let me go into the other screen. Oh, before that, again, let me show you the code. Uh, so this one, no. Okay. Let me show you the code. Uh, go full screen again. So simulation. No, it's not this one. Sorry. Uh, maybe we should open up the. This is one. Okay, so it's the same. Um, some rules in terms of the uh, the parameters here. Here I use the uh, uh, ratio, race ratio, uh, and also the number of races here. Uh, 
and the rest is actually also not very uh, not very complicated so um, the code is here if you want you can just take a look at it it's uh, uh, available on the, the blog post and you can just download it and uh, take a look at it but let me just show you the, the simulation itself okay so that's the code uh, So I use three races. So um, basically, one 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 here means that uh, three races equal. They are all equal sizes, and uh, the min here means every every uh, race has a preference, and the preference is it's at the minimum it must have uh, four or more neighbors that are same race as I am. If I have uh, less than that i will shift if i have or i move to a, a, a different vacant spot and uh, if i have uh, more than that then i will just stay put right the max is the reverse if i have uh, uh less than that then i would uh, uh, stay put if i have more than that then i will move right so why is there a max so i put a max here which is not in the original shelling's original uh, model the reason why I put a max is because I wanted to simulate something else, something different, which is a uh, sort of like a, uh, a, a rule or some kind of mandate that uh, within a neighborhood, you cannot have um, people who are of the same race as you are more than a certain number of people, so a certain percentage of people. Like So, for example, uh, if you have more than... Uh, uh, Six people, who, six neighbors who are of the same race as you are, then you know you are not allowed to continue living there. You have to move away. So that is the kind of uh, cap that I was trying to, to simulate. But anyway, here is the simulation. Let me just uh, run very quickly. And so you see that the 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 races do segregate themselves, self segregation essentially. Um, and they will cluster towards their, their own people uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, so obviously there are other different uh, scenarios and uh, uh, the part of the fun is really to play around with the ratios, play around with the, the mins, because the numbers can be different, right? So let's see, um, I can do this. So this guy, he doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really matter to this particular race, uh, the, the neighbors, and you can sort of guess which race it is, right? It's, it's, uh, in case you don't know, it's the, the green one. Uh, it don't really care, so that's how it goes. But does it stop the other races from clustering, from uh, segregating themselves? No, it doesn't, right? The, the green race, they are okay. They, they are okay to be uh, everywhere, but uh, it doesn't actually help in the overall scheme of things, yeah. and so on and so forth. So this, this kind of simulation uh, basically allows you to test out certain theories, test out certain uh, certain scenarios that you, you think might be true. Uh, you can, can actually change the rules, can change the parameters. But I think overall what I, I wanted to, to do with Petri is really to, to create a framework where you can create such simulations uh, quickly. So um, obviously for this particular uh, case, it's all CA, it's all within the grid. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, simulations can be uh, simplified into a grid and you can test out uh, uh, different scenarios using it. So uh, if you are interested in this kind of uh, simulations, uh, feel free to just get hold of the code, get hold of uh, Petri and try it out yourself. And that's it. That's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed that. And back to you, teacher. Oh, no. I'm supposed to answer questions. If there are any questions uh, I can answer, please let me know. Okay, so I have some questions to write. Yeah. So the one of them is also Stanley. Oh, this is oh, a Stanley. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
what actions governments can take to observation some of these models to promote racial harmony and how would this tune the parameters of the real life situation? Um, so one of the reasons why I put in the max is really to simulate that environment, right? So in, in Singapore, there is an act that uh, prevents you from staying in a particular location if there are more, uh, I mean, a certain ratio of races can only exist in, in a certain uh, 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 in neighborhood, you cannot have, say, an exclusively Chinese or exclusively Indian or exclusively whatever uh, Malay uh, uh, neighborhood. That actually uh, is not allowed, right? So the law is, I can't remember exactly what the name of the law is now. I, I was doing some research on it and I found out. Um, but um, so how did it work out for Singapore? I would say, I would say, okay, I, I don't really know. Uh, but if you look at my simulation, right? The max doesn't really help. The max does not really uh, give you any advantage at all. So uh, if I can just quickly run the simulation, right? So it, it, it here means basically it, it, it is there's nothing. Okay, so let's let's put a six here. Uh, or let's go back to the four. What happens? chaos happens, right? Because everybody keeps moving. Nobody can stay, you know? Uh, and this is not a desired state, right? So that, that becomes a problem. Uh, and why is it that everybody uh, moves away? And the reason is because of, of this, right? Uh, it's because of this, this 444 here, you know? Because uh, people are generally not so tolerant of their neighbors, yeah? Uh, let's, let's move it to a 222. It stabilizes, and you can see it's pretty diversified, right? So what does it tell you? It, it, what does it tell tell you from the simulation? Basically, it says that the the cap doesn't really help anything. The max doesn't really help anything. It's the min. The min means that how tolerant you are to others. That is what really helps. Not the uh, not the government rules that tell you no, this ratio cannot exist in this this particular context, right? But again, to be fair, this is my simulation. Uh, in reality, how does this, uh, how did it actually turn out for Singapore? I, I think, I mean, Singapore is pretty harmonious, but uh, can we say it's because of the um, of this the rules? I, I don't really know, but for my simulation, I, I think uh, probably not. I, I would say. Yeah, so, so I don't know how controversial that is, but uh, I, I just said it. Okay, uh, hope nobody. Like uh, it's just, <laughs> just come knocking at my door later. Um, okay, so Suyin asked, uh, the problem is not, or uh, he made a comment, the problem is not the results, not typically this minister in Japan hardly on initial conditions, butterfly creating a hurricane syndrome. So the, the initial, um, most of my, my initial are actually randomized. Uh, so you can keep running different random scenarios. So obviously if you create something that's uh, deterministic initially, then it can sort of escalate into different things. Um, so I, I guess that's that's what it is. But uh, for my simulations, they are all randomized. So uh, I, I did not get any scenarios where, you know, uh, if I run something, it's very radically different from a, a different set of uh, starting scenarios. So uh, for me, at least that never really happened. But obviously I did spend all my time you know, doing this over and over and over again. I did it quite a lot of times, but uh, I never really encountered uh, such a scenario. Although I cannot uh, dis dispute that maybe something uh, might happen if you run it long enough. Um, Matt asked, is there anything specific about Go that makes writing this kind of simulations easy? Um, I think I think what helped for me is, uh, is being able to uh, I mean, it's the speed of of uh, Go actually helps me a lot in this, and um, I'm not sure whether it is Go specifically that uh, uh, will be very helpful to writing this kind of simulations. I just enjoy Go, and uh, Go is a language I enjoy writing in, and uh, simulations is something I enjoy doing. So I put uh, one and one together, and it came out with this. Uh, but I, I think um, Go help me in a way that it is uh, it is relatively simple to write this with 
and uh, the speed that I can actually generate the different generations uh, is pretty useful as well. Now, to be fair, I have not done this in, say, Python or Java, like, and then started to do comparisons in terms of the length, the, the speed, and, and, and everything. But uh, at least for me, it's, it's speedy enough. Um, the setting here, if I, if I look, uh, if I have enough time, uh, I can show a little bit more. Let's try to open the other one, which is uh, Patri. Like, so um, I have a lot of different types of settings. Uh, let me go to the, I have, uh, sorry. I have a number of uh, uh, different settings, right? So I can change the cell size. I can change the refresh rate. Uh, I can make it run a lot faster. The, the grid size is relatively small, so it's 36 times 36, uh, X number of cells. Uh, you can go pretty big. I can go like uh, hundreds and, and thousands, right, in, in terms of the size. Uh, to, a certain, to a certain level, it will stop being effective anymore because uh, the refresh rate will be just too slow. Um, but I think uh, it can go quite big before I hit that particular ceiling. So I think that's one more thing that uh, really helped uh, in Go. Okay, any other questions? I guess not. That was probably the last question. Yeah. All right. I do have a, yeah. So I do have one question. Uh, why do you name it Patri as a framework? Oh, Patri dish. Right, uh, yeah, it's a petri dish. So it's a petri dish, and there are cells in it. So then the cells grow. So that's why it's called petri. Okay. <laughs> kind of corny, I know, but uh, you know, yeah, I, it's just just me. <laughs> okay, good to know. Right. Okay. <laughs> that was an interesting uh, talk. Um, I guess there's no more questions. Um, okay. All right, um, we can go on to the second talk. I'm just waiting for the screen to switch. Right, thank you, Saoshong, for that first talk. And uh, next up, we have Matt, who will talk about pace.dev uh, and his technical deep dive. Over to you, Matt. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, nice to see you all. My name's Matt Ryer. Um, yeah, I do the uh, Go Time podcast. So if you don't, if you haven't heard this, it's a, an English podcast where we talk about Go, and it's a free podcast, so you can just listen to it for free. Um, and I blog about this tech also, uh, and a lot of it comes out of our work in Pace. Um, a lot of the technical blogs and things. So there's a lot of technical work to sort of do on a project, of course. Um, and actually, that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to uh, show you, just show you some of the tech behind what we've built, uh, some of the decisions that we took and why, and some of the philosophies that um, that lead us to those decisions. They tend to be quite surprising to people, and so that's why I quite enjoy talking about them. Um, so hopefully there's enough for everybody um, at all different levels to get out of this talk. Specifically, I'm going to cover, I'll give an overview of what Pace is first, um, but I want to talk about the architecture that, that we have, our technical architecture, um, and how that works and why we chose uh, ultra simple architecture. Um, we do have some remote procedure calls and there's some interesting tech around that that I want to dig into uh, and talk about code generation. We use code generation um, and it turns out to be an extremely powerful thing if you get it right. And again, a lot of these things are possible to abuse, and I'll talk about that stuff as well. Of course, testing is a big thing for me. Um, I'm, it's something I'm very interested in, and good testing for a project is what helps you evolve that product with confidence. You know, if you've got good sets of tests behind you, 
you can be quite bold in your changes. And um, that's important, especially for us. It's an early stage startup. We want to be responsive and rapid and we want to be able to react to feedback. Testing, good testing helps us do that. And I'll also talk about how we how we do some background work as well. There's some background tasks which we will always need uh, uh, to, to do. And, and you, you want to do that also in a way that's simple and not too complicated because it quickly does get complicated. So what, is, excuse me, <coughs> what is Pace.dev? Uh, well, it's actually just a web-based project management tool. It's, um, you know, we, we were using Jira a lot and we were using a few of these other tools. We use Slack a lot in previous companies. And we found that actually it, it, they weren't encouraging good practice. You know, Slack, basically it's an IM, it's an instant messaging app. So when you message somebody, you expect a reply. And if you don't get a reply, and sometimes we would turn Slack off so that we could focus and work without just hearing those little knocks all the time. Sometimes uh, when we turned it off, we'd when we when we open it back up again, we'd see that there are people there kind of uh, frustrated that we were ignoring them. They feel ignored. And it's not their fault. It's not our fault. It was really the fault of the expectations that the app sets. So that was the idea. We wanted a asynchronous communication tool that also let us track work in a kind of familiar way. Um, and so, of course, technically, there's lots of different ways to do that, to achieve that. So what did we do? Well, we have experience. Um, Sao Chong in the last uh, talk talked about using Go because he enjoyed using Go. And that sounds like, it just sounds frivolous, doesn't it, when you hear that? But actually, I think there's something key about that. Whenever we do work, when we're using tech that we enjoy or we're, we're using tools that we enjoy, the work seems to be better, certainly is for me. And that's why I would use Go. I even would use Go where Go probably isn't the best tool, the best possible choice, but it's something I enjoy and I'm familiar with and I have fun doing it. So I think having fun, choosing tech that you have fun with is something we should consider. Of course, in bigger teams, you don't always, it doesn't always come down to that. You don't always have that choice. Um, but actually at Pace, we're a kind of tiny team. There's there's uh, two of us building this. So uh, there's a lot, lot of freedom that, that comes in with that too. So Pace is a set of Go API services. So literally HTTP handler services. And we run them in Google App Engine. The nice thing about Google App Engine is that you can just give your, you just upload your code, you upload your project, and it builds it for you. It it runs the instances when they're needed. It scales those instances down to zero if nobody's using it. Hopefully, we won't be using that feature very much. But it's nice for small and and big projects. But in particular, if you're a startup. You know, you only want you only want to pay for what you're going to be using, and so App Engine is a good way to do that. There are, of course, other options that are a similar kind of thing. It's but it's a sort of serverless approach, and it's nice for us because we get to write our app and just with a simple command we deploy it, and it we know it's ready for big scale. Because if if we have bursts of traffic, we know that Google will spin up more instances to cope with those. That, that demand, you know, and so uh, that that as a developer is very nice, um, particularly if you if you aren't into doing ops. Again, if you if it's not something you enjoy or you don't have that expertise on the team, um, it's nice to be able to just hand that off. We wanted the UX to be nice, and so it has a rich front end, and so we built that in Svelte JS. And I know if you haven't seen Svelte JS, it's quite interesting. It's kind of like React and Angular except that it does a lot of its work at compile time. So instead of there being virtual DOMs and runtime things going on in the browser, the, the Svelte tooling kind of does all that work ahead of time. 
So, for example, um, if you change some data in React, that's going to trigger some handler to run, which will probably have an array of different callbacks that need to be called. You know, um, it will then do the changes. It then compares the virtual DOM to the to the current DOM and does a diff on that, and then it knows what to update. You know, so it's clever. But of course, there's work to do in the browser, which of course is um, that takes resource from the browser. And in Svelte, it doesn't do that. It essentially does all the wiring up beforehand. So if changing some data is going to have an impact in the app, it it will figure out what impact it's going to have and kind of hardwire it at compile time. So there was something nice about that. Svelte also has a minimalist kind of um, design. So again, that appealed to us. Go has that same thing, the minimalism in Go. You know, there aren't loads of language features in Go. There are just some core ones. And with that, you can build what you need. It means that it's easier to learn and easier to easy to maintain code, frankly, because, you, you know, you don't have to dig in. Like in C++, you can override operators. So that means you can change what the plus symbol does on some numbers. Um, and things like that. And, <laughs> I don't, you know, sometimes it makes sense. Like if you've got your own custom type where you could add values together, you want to be able to implement that. Um, but being able to override them on existing things, I think, is quite a strange feature to have in a language. So Go often will look limited to people outside Go, but there's great benefits you get from having that more simplified approach. And Svelte has the same thing. Svelte also compiles into static assets, which makes deployments very easy. So we 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 build our front end, and that generates essentially CSS and JavaScript files. We then, using the G Cloud Google Cloud tools, upload all of that to App Engine, and that's where it's then served from. And App Engine even does um, static assets in a kind of uh, special way, where it distributes them on the CDN so that your static assets will be very quick. They're delivered locally around the world to people. So again, that's quite nice, especially in our context, because we're building a tool we expect to have people from all over the world using it. Um, and we don't want it to be slow just because you happen to be in, say, Australia or something where your internet connection is not, not very great. Um, okay, so we use... They're, they're the two main technologies we use. We use make files. Um, there are other options for that too. It's just something we're familiar with, but little script files to just run common commands. And then we use some of the services provided in Google App Engine. Um, for example, there's a PubSub service. They have, of course, their storage for files and things. And we use the Firebase data store as well. So really, that's it. There isn't a great deal more to our application than that. The other thing that's worth saying is we use a mono repo, um, and that means everything, all the code for our company is in one repo. That includes the website, the blog, the app itself, and then any tools that we build along the way. Also, we'll just go into this mono repo. Um, again, this isn't always a choice that teams get to make, but if you do make this choice, one of the nice side effects is a change, a pull request, can contain changes to the app, changes to the front end, you know, API changes, documentation changes, tests will probably change too, all in one PR. And so when it gets merged, your the whole system is advancing as one and getting better, hopefully, in one go, in one event. And you cut out a lot of the pain of synchronizing changes. Imagine if you have these projects distributed. Now we have to make sure we merge this API change at the same time that we merge this one and maybe the documentation's in its own repo. And suddenly there's work to do to manage releases and things. If you have a mono repo and we deploy master, so everything, ev everything in master is ready to be deployed. It, it, it's very simple. It's a very simple approach. And um, again, I think sometimes looks naive. And it's one of those things where this is how I used to do it. And then I learned how to do software engineering properly. And I would do all this complicated stuff. 
and live with all that pain. And then I've kind of come all the way back around to, I'm just going to do it this way again and keep it all dead simple. That is a kind of common theme to our uh, to this talk and also our development at pace. We will choose simplicity uh, at almost any cost. And usually there isn't a great deal of cost. So I'm going to give a quick demo of the uh, the application itself so you can see what it is. Essentially, we have uh, kind of inbox-like messaging here for conversations. They're asynchronous conversations. So the nice thing is you aren't expected to reply immediately. You know, when you start a conversation in here, uh, we know that uh, people are busy and they'll get round to it when they get round to it. Of course, if you are ha if you do happen to be online at the same time as other people, it works in that same way as a uh, an IM, and it's immediate. It has live live feedback, live updates, and things. But it isn't the expectation that we set by default. By default, it's async. So we really want to protect developer time there. Uh, this is you can see these are probably quite familiar. These are cards we have, and then you can go and look in a card, and there's comments, and there's different statuses you have. Um, and the same kind of thing with conversations. We have conversations that you can uh, chat about and, you know, you've got reactions and comments and things. Um, all quite familiar, I would hope. We we have a few other features, like we have this showcasing capability where we want to let people show off their work. Um, but essentially, you could imagine that is a somewhat simple uh, web application. Um, and, I, and then I'm going to dig into some of the um, some of the details of the technical things around behind that too. Um, before I do, I want to just say we we work in a kind of strange way at pace to some people, and that is that we pair program almost exclusively. So pair programming, if you haven't ever tried it, I do recommend trying it. It has some strange benefits. Firstly, it's two two minds working on the same thing at the same time. Um, that can work really well. It does for us. Um, you know, you spot typos very quickly. You you get to sort of validate. It's almost having a linter happening, but not just checking your code, thinking about the kind of impact, the whole system, really, thinking about the impact of what you're doing and how that's going to, uh, manifest and uh, and that that's difficult to do when you're focused on the particular problem when you're looking at that small problem it's quite difficult to see what impact that's going to have having a partner helps with that a little bit and then there's other benefits like you know the knowledge is shared immediately so my uh, business partner David knows as much about the system as I do and so we're both kind of empowered to, to go and look at any part of the system. Again, you can do that when it's small, but it does apply in, in larger teams as well. Uh, you know, knowledge transfer and maintenance and things is often a, a difficult thing to get right. And pair programming helps with that. So I wanted to make a quick point about that before we get on to talking about our architecture. One thing I liked from Sal's um, talk just now was this thing, how... Very simple rules, when applied kind of in aggregate, can can turn into something quite different. You know, this pattern emerged from a very simple little rule. Um, so if you think about that from a technology point of view, any package, every component, every function, and every variable, everything we add will have an impact and it's not an impact that's easy to see just by focusing on that small thing. So if you think about the rule that we looked at, which is the binary rule, um, you wouldn't be able to imagine, I don't think, this pattern from that. And that's really what we're trying to do when we design systems. We're trying to imagine what's this aggregate shape, what's the shape this is going to produce, not the shape of the individual pieces, because they're quite simple and small and easy to see. It's how they interact together and and how that also interacts with real people and things. 
So I, I really like, I really appreciated kind of this. Um, and anyone that didn't see the talk, if you can, I recommend it. Um, okay, so our architecture is simple. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I can demonstrate that by showing uh, this is the mono repo folder. So we have this paste.dev repo, and here's everything we have inside that. So you can see, look, there's the blog. Uh, this is our website. We've got some tools here, uh, some other experiments. Um, there's a few things, configuration files that you need for uh, App Engine, like this dispatch YAML is how you tell, is how you tell it uh, which routes map to which components. Um, so you can see there that we do have different components, but they're all inside the mono repo, and they just distribute like that. Where we have our website, we as you can see, have static HTML files. This again, isn't something that most people would consider kind of high quality en software engineering. It's just a static HTML file for the homepage, but, it, and it is look, it's just a, it's got all the styles in there and everything. You'd think that this was written by um, somebody just out of college that hasn't got much experience. Um, in fact, that's what people have said about this when we show this off. And I take it as a compliment in some ways because of the simplicity of it. And that's kind of one of the messages I want to get across is don't feel like because something's simple that it somehow isn't proper engineering. You know what I mean? Proper engineering is really about keeping things as simple as possible. So if an index file, index.html file will do, then you don't need anything more complex than that. And we've done the same thing with our application architecture. In here, I opened the application. This is our app folder. This is the actual, the, the Go services and the front end. These are those two things, basically, and a few other bits and pieces. And we just have one, one folder here for our uh, pub sub handlers. These, and, and these are our public handlers. Uh, and I can show those off by showing you the roots file. So you can see in here, we're using this sort of standard Muxa. This is the HTTP handler pattern here. We're using the handler func, um, the, or we have all these functions which are just scattered about here. So notice we haven't broken all this stuff down into little packages. This is all just out in one folder, and we use file names to group things up. So you can see that all these handlers are handling PubSub. There's a few other handlers that handle different things. And there's a Stripe handler there, the webhook Stripe handler. That's very easy to see by looking at those files, I think. Again, people will say this should be broken into packages, broken down into folders. You know, you should have proper architecture. You need to be able to have architecture diagrams and things. And that's true at some points and in some contexts, but don't assume it's true, I would, I would say, you know, because it may not be. And it's a bit like trying to picture that pyramid shape. That's a very difficult thing to imagine when you only have these components, these small pieces to look at. Um, and the equivalent would be to try and imagine what folder structure we should have to house this thing quite difficult to do uh, with the more the more experience you get the better you get at doing that i think but you really um end up making a lot of assumptions and uh, and sometimes they're things that you really have no business making firm assumptions about that early so our approach is flat folder structure and when or if there are problems with this then we'll tackle that and we'll refactor. But we aren't going to start there. We're not going to start with a big complicated architecture. We do have a little, and we have this API package. And this API package basically encapsulates all the all the API, all the services. You know, um, Pace works, it's got back-end Go services and a rich front-end, and they communicate through RPC calls. And I'll, I'll talk more about that soon. Um, that that works. Um, it works in a really sort of simple way because you just have front end and back end. You know, 
Uh, of course, it's possible to break an API down by all these different things. Like we could have cache services, we could have billing services, we could have file services, all as their own individual components. And some people do architect things like that. Um, th there's pain that comes with doing that. Uh, and, you know, if you think about even just packages having import cycles and um, then strange dependencies and dependency work you have to do to figure out, well, you know, suddenly now this thing over here and this thing have something in common. So we're going to try and find that commonality and break it out into a third thing. And then when um, when another thing comes along that kind of needs that, it's too tempting to just use it and, you know, it doesn't quite fit. So we add things to it. That is how you end up with kind of Frankenstein architectures that um, that are difficult to maintain. And, uh, and you get scared and worried when you go and work on certain bits of it. And that is a bad feeling. We don't want that feeling. When you have everything like this, you just don't have that problem. You, we can we can use the, we can give these services to each other in a flat way, right? I can if this file service needs some dependencies, which it does, they're just fields in this struct. Look, so we've got a file service. It needs the internal file service. It needs the org service. It needs the text internal service. You know, and they're they're spelled out in a strongly typed way. So there is no way to get this file service that we need without providing the dependencies. So that means that the Go compiler is going to be helping us make sure we've got this right. And it becomes a no-brainer. So these sorts of simple little things, um, they really help when it comes to uh, actually maintaining code. Because you don't have to fight with this architecture that you dreamed up too early. It's all just flat. Again, and I forgive people for saying this. We did we did show this off, and the first thing somebody said was, "It looks like we don't know how to architect things." That's basically what they said, um, and I think that that drives a lot of people to these complicated architectures. So I want to make the case for this. This might well evolve. It might well. Uh, change, and and I could imagine if, for example, our uh, one of these services, let's say the messages service, uh, or let's say the comments service, yeah, I could imagine the comments are used a lot more than other parts of this system, and so you could make a case for having that comment service broken out into its own thing. Well, that's still very easy to do because it's just a type. We still have Next. this. Yes, Matt, will you be able to enlarge your screen? I think the course is a bit small. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But is that you. better? Um, is it, it, hopefully that's better. This is on my um, twenty-seven inch iMac, so that is the biggest font I've ever had on this screen now. So it's certainly big enough for me. But how is that for everybody? Is that okay? Is that looking better? I'll carry on assuming it is. So if I wanted to pull this comment service into its own component and deploy it independently, because that's really the value of having microservices, is you can control the one of the one of the value properties. You can control how they're deployed. And and you can scale independently a certain part of the system that might get used more. Well, that's certainly still possible. These there's still sensible to group functionality up by type like like we do in go um so yeah that's that's the thing it's still flat we don't try and build complicated package hierarchies but there is still structure here uh it's just that it's emerging rather than us trying to design it by force if that makes sense We have a few cases of packages which we we do pull out, and this allows us to keep them n neat. Sometimes this makes sense to us, um, and sometimes we actually regret this. Sometimes we'll create a package just because cognitively it's uh, nice to have a clean space to work. 
And then later we say, There's, we aren't going to use this package elsewhere. We aren't going to open source this thing. Uh, so maybe this just goes in the general with the general code and there's no benefit. But sometimes it's just uh, nice to have a sort of clean sort of storytelling as well in your code. And that's quite a good reason, I think, to pull things into their own packages. So we have this file. Uh, this is just providing some string slice uh, help. Like we have this in function, which checks to see if a string is in another, is in a slice of strings. Um, we have a without one here, which is going to get this slice and remove uh, a string from it. So this is kind of just string slice manipulation. It all kind of belongs in one place. And we can unit test it nicely as well. Um, so we do have some examples of little packages like that um, dotted throughout. Uh, the next main area I want to talk about is our uh, remote procedure calls. So as I mentioned, Pace is a rich front end and it communicates through a series of API calls. And you can see them in the browser here. I will try and make this bigger. Um, so you can see here, look, we have, it's very easy to see, by the way, which service and which method is being called here. Um, you know, this from a usability point of view really helps when it comes to debugging. Um, so you can see that we have this paste.dev slash auto tag service dot get all tags. So that matches our code. It's very easy for me to come and find the tags service. And in here, there will be a method uh, of get all tags, which I can find for you here. So um, again, there's no, there's no reason to hide things unnecessarily. That's another thing that I think we try and do, it, it comes from wanting to protect internals and allowing yourselves to change them without affecting the outside world. Um, well, this is an API that's being consumed by this front end. It's not a public API. So we don't have that problem. And so we'll opt again for what's the most simple and what's the most obvious for us when it comes to debugging it, you know. Um, and having a having a good URL is a great start for that. So this auto piece here is actually a clue as to how we're doing this. We made a little RPC project. Um, and we made it because we looked at gRPC, we looked at a few other options, and they were either either the complexity was was uh, such that we didn't feel like, you know, we wanted to take on the burden of learning new technology. There were a few technical problems with gRPC, which may have gone away now in App Engine. Um, it used to be that you, in fact, you can't open your own ports. You know, when you when you deploy to the the Google servers, they really are controlling which ports are open. They do a lot of routing and things. With gRPC, because it's a binary protocol, the, a lot of the tooling wanted you to open a, a port that was explicitly for gRPC communication. So in some contexts, that's just not okay. And there are some great projects to get around it, um, like uh, gRPC Gateway and this JSON gRPC things, but they just weren't available for us at the time. So we rolled our own little project. This is another thing which you can do when there's only two of you and you're a tiny team. Um, often you you may find yourself in uh, bigger companies and there may be lots of people having to kind of work on services early. That would change how you make these decisions probably. Um, you know, we, we, we are in a position of privilege in some extent, to some extent, because we... We don't have a lot of the pressures that are faced uh, on other projects. Um, and we are both acting as the product owners here and the technical owners. So by fusing that into one, you know, we, we're in a different situation. We can make decisions based solely on technical things sometimes and likewise purely product decisions other times. But I think everybody should... Uh, should get a say in in those things too. It's important that that technical 
expertise does make its way into other parts of the business. So even in bigger teams, these things matter. They're still important and worth having these conversations. So Oto was born out of the need for us to want to have just a standard way of describing RPC services, essentially. And since we love Go, we um, we designed it around Go. In fact, you describe your services using Go interfaces. So gRPC has Protobuf, which is this kind of looks a bit like Go anyway, but of course it isn't, and has other features in there that we didn't need and don't need. Um, but what we like about this is we can describe a service using language that we're very familiar with and using tooling that we're very familiar with. You know, this our definition files are working Go code. We get compile time checks and help. So let's have a look at the comments service here. So if I, by the way, make a mistake, if I put request to there and save it, you can see I get my ID is telling me that's an undeclared name. It's no such type. So I, I, I've got strong types here when describing my API, which is very nice. Every service method, every service, I should say, is an interface. So you can see that there's this comment service here, and it has a, uh, a request type and a response type. And we follow this pattern of just using the same name and then followed by request response. So actually, there's a bit, there's not much work to do when it comes to describing the service. Um, let's look at get, uh, let's look at add comment. So we've got this add comment request here, and there's a type, and it's just a type in here like you would with Go, and it has fields and just uses all the Go fields that are allowed. You can use other types here. You can use uh, maps, you know, anything really that, that can be expressed in a JSON way, you can use. Uh, and that, again, is kind of simple. We, we're aware of JSON tech. Uh, you know, we know how to use it. We know what, it's, what it can do and what it can't do. Uh, so it was a great choice. And if you think about this kind of application, it's kind of uh, perfect. You are making RPC is a sort of perfect um, design choice for this particular case. May not be true in your case, but may also be true. So everything has a request and a response and is very easy to see. And we can just by reading this file, we know our API. Oto then uses templates to take this. It parses it using the Go packages. The Go has a series of kind of um, Go code parsing uh, capabilities. Go used to be written in C, and then once Go was written, they then rewrote it in Go, which is a very strange thing to happen. Uh, what that means is there are some decent packages that allow you to... Um, process and understand Go code. And that's what we do. We we process this definition package. We pull out all the interfaces and all the type information. And we build essentially an in-memory model of that using our own types. And it, Oto, by the way, is an open source project. So if you go and look in parser.go, you can actually see those and those types. Um, so you can see, look, there's a definition there. It has a package name, some services, different objects, imports. Because it's Go code, you can import other Go code. So we had to solve imports as well. Um, a service just has a name and methods. Method has an input and an output object. As I said, we, we, we dramatically simplified everything here. Um, a, a, an object, well, uh, inputs and output types, they're types, they're field types. So we did have to also model types in this. But anyway, you end up with Go strongly typed structures describing those that API, those services. And from that, we render Go code using various templates. So as an example, we have this server Go template. 
And this essentially, you can see it's kind of Go code, but it has these uh, templating things injected into it and, you know, loops and things like this. So for all the imports there, we add the import. And we're basically writing temp using templates to write Go code. So this is probably the weirdest part of Oto, you know, because it's kind of meta programming. Um, but what you end up with is very easy, very nice to read, and very simple Go code, which you can then use in your project. And that's what we do. So these templates will generate the server and the client. You can see the client, the JavaScript client. Um, and all it's doing is encoding. It, it takes, you know, it, it creates a class. It's literally a class here in JavaScript. For each method, we add a method. And you can see there's some string manipulation to make it feel more JavaScript-y, like, because Go, you know, doesn't use camelized, camelized uh, formats, you know. So we, we try and uh, make the code look like the language that it's generating for. And it's just doing the common things. You can see it makes the request here, sets the headers, creates the body from the input type. Then it... It, it actually fet uses the fetch API here to make the call to the server. If, if there's a, a response, then we get the JSON back. And if there's a JSON, if there's an error in that JSON through this specific type that we manage, then we throw it and, you know, it uses the promises API in, in the front end. So if you're not familiar with that, don't worry. But the net result is we have a server and client it's just generated for us. And then I'll show you literally what gets generated actually, because this is the this is quite cool. We have here this Oto Gen file. This this entire file is is generated by Oto. And you can see it's quite long. Um 4,000 4, lines plus. Um, and essentially it just contains essentially our implementation of um, what we want the Oto services to do for us. So we generate an interface for each of the services. In the definition, there was already an interface, but our, our Go code needs a few more things. So it's, it's a different interface. And these are in different packages, so it's okay. So we have an admin service interface here, and you can see that each method gets its own method, but we've added the context here, and in the response, you can also return an error. One of the nice things about Go is um, the explicitness around error handling, and we didn't want to lose that even in our API layer. So when we write Go code, when we write, implement these services, we're able to just return errors in the normal way, and they'll be handled in one place, in the consistent way. So that's quite nice. Um, and that's something that we added after a few iterations of this. So again, even with this, this wasn't just our initial design. This has its, itself has evolved. Uh, the context, taking the context in is quite useful because sometimes there's some long operations, some work that's going to go on. And if, if, the, if the user has canceled that request in a browser, that can just mean they've clicked on something else or closed their browser. The, that context will get cancelled by the Go HTTP package. And you can abort the work. and You can save yourself some time. Um, there's also timeouts and things that you can enforce using this, this pattern. And also, sometimes other services that we use need context as well. So it's nice to have this kind of as a common pattern that we have. Well, now Oto has generated that for us. Um, we just have to implement these interfaces and, and that, then we've, we can wire them up. And we wire them up using the, the, these helpers that are generated again for us. So every method actually gets its own handler. And it's just using the auto HTTP package to decode the request into the specific type. Look, that's a spe special type that we've talked about. We then will you know this in this case it's calling the billing service to get the billing info notice this is a real http handler so this is 
uh, the thing that's listening on the on, for that route. Um, we then call the real implementation. We know we're going to get back a strongly typed response, and we just encode that response to the server. So this is simple. It, 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 when Go gets generics, it might be possible to have this kind of code written once in your project. But because everything's strongly typed in our project here, uh, we needed this for every type. So that's why we have it. And with code generation, it's easy because you sort of just have to write it once in a weird meta way, and then the rest of it's generated for you. It also generates these register functions. So you can see that we're going to pass in an auto server. We're going to pass in the implementation. So again, this is generated, and that's using the strong typed service name there. This is the interface. So what this does is this is creating the uh, the, the comment service server type, and it gives it the server and the, and the actual implementation, and then it just uses this register command to map, essentially, the inputs. And that's how, then, with the routing, it's able to take the web request and turn it into a Go method call and back out through that. And that's it. It doesn't do too much more than that. It's nice that the handlers are real HTTP handlers because that allows us to then use usual middleware and things that we that we might already be familiar with in a uh, in in our code, and we do that for auth and things. Wherever there's common commonality, we can we can wrap these. So uh, we're left then in the comments service with this this constructor basically returns the interface because there is an interface and that means if we do anything wrong like maybe i called this delete comments instead or you'll notice that there's some problems with that namely this one and it's saying you can't use this type because you don't satisfy the interface so we get strong type help throughout um, with these services. And so that's what turns into, excuse me, let me find it in here again. That's what turns into these calls. They are, they're just, and in the front end, it's just like calling Java, local JavaScript functions. They get rooted through this to the back end through the HTTP stuff and uh, uh, down through that little stack into a method and the response comes back this way so if i would if i were to ask uh, david let's say uh, how where we should put a new service the answer's obvious we put it with all the other services if i were to ask him how we oh let me just fix that if i were to ask him how should we model this? How should we represent this? It's kind of solved already for us. Um, and so that that's kind of a nice um, shortcut that we get. And it's, it's, it's working really quite nicely so far. Um, so the, temp the other thing that's worth saying is that we also write and maintain our own templates for Oto. So there are some in the repo, but the point is you basically write your own templates so that it, it does exactly what you need it to do. And there's a wider sort of philosophical point around, around this. And the same thing applied to our blog. We had the choice of using static generation tools to build our blog. And Hugo was the one that I was looking at initially. Um, because, you know, it's written in Go, it's extremely fast, it's quite mature now, it's got a lot of users. Um, when we started to use it, it was complicated for us. There was a lot of little things that we felt like we had to learn. You had to learn how to use the tool, and that was a barrier. And we already know how to write Go code. Um, uh, and so, in some cases, we took the choice of rolling our own where you could you could see the case being made for um, using an existing tool off the shelf because you know 
naturally, we always just want to write everything. And it is worth resisting that. But when you do write it yourself, you can write exactly what you need. So there's a trade-off there that you do have to be very careful with. But what it means is um, you have full control. I'll jump quickly into a, the blog because I just want to show show that. It's a similar kind of uh, point here. Um, we have a this uh, blog generation tool here. And this is essentially just a main file. It runs through all of the blog markdown, which is the source content. So I could I could say uh, I could find a, a post here. Find a good one. So this is a post about dynamically generating uh, social media images in Go. It's just a markdown file that has images. So again. Um, when you put this in GitHub, th these files get rendered quite nicely. They're quite easy to work with. We already know Markdown, um, and we're just using the same uh, kind of uh, things that we already use today. So, you know, we already know how to do links and things in Markdown. So having a, a blog that allows us to write it in the same way kind of gives us that, uh, that benefit. So our tool will basically walks this source folder and looks for these markdown files. This is literally a .md file at the end. And then whenever it finds one, it, it reads it. It reads the, the initial bits at the top, and this becomes kind of metadata about the post. Uh, and then it uses templating again to render the actual post itself. So here's what gets rendered for dynamically generating those social media images. You can see that not only do we generate the raw HTML, so again, it's a static HTML file in the end that's going to be served. These are the easiest things to serve because, um, you know, particularly in App Engine and there's other options that do it. With When they use CDNs, this static content is lightning fast all over the world. So it's very appealing to be able to deploy a static thing. The alternative would be to have a blog that's dynamically mixing templates and things at runtime, and then maybe have caching on top to then give you some of, some of the protection and some scale. Uh, static assets are even simpler than that. And we do things like this. We generate these little social media Images which get sh they, these show up when you share your when you share these blog posts, um, and so for example here, uh, you know you can see it's got the logo on it, it's got our blog URL, and then this title. When you share that, say on LinkedIn, and you see the little cursor blinking and things, it's a more engaging experience, uh, and we've noticed since we had these, we get we get more traffic. Um, this this is quite meta because this is a blog post about how we generate those images. So if you are interested in generating these for your own thing, uh, we we wrote a blog post about it. It's actually here. You can either read the HTML or go to pace.dev slash blog and you'll find it there. Um, okay. I mean, that's essentially the blog. The reason I wanted to show that off is, is really just to make that point that Yes, this was extra work for us. So it was an investment. It's not free. Uh, but we have complete control of our blog. Um, and if if we need it to do anything that would have been difficult in Hugo, we can do it very easily. Again, you have to be careful with that because there's trade-offs everywhere. But that's really the power of code generation, and I believe. That was my next slide. Yeah, so we do. We use code generation quite a bit. And even with generics, we still would use code generation because, you know, for example, Oto taking those um, those service definitions and having the type safety there, that's a code gen story, really. The reason that works is because of code generation. If we had to write the plumbing for every method we added, that wouldn't be very nice. We wouldn't be very keen to add services and enhance the system. So um, we'd probably avoid it. 
Another area that's I'm particularly uh, interested in is testing. Um, testing is basically how you're able to sleep at night. Uh, you you deploy. We can I can deploy pace anytime, and I deploy it by typing that make deploy. This now is going to go and do a build, and it's going to deploy our app. Um, and the reason I'm so confident in doing this is this little bit here where it's now running all the tests. So you'll see here uh, in a minute, it's going to run through and run an entire suite of tests. If all of those tests pass, then I'm confident we can deploy the application. If anything fails, then this deploy actually will be aborted. So testing, if you do it properly, can really give you uh, the confidence to move in a robust and uh, quick way. Actually, it turns out it turns out to be very speed. It speeds things up quite a lot because um, you know you, you aren't you don't have to do as much work worrying about uh, unexpected side effects to your changes. Uh, without tests, you would have to just manually test it, basically. You still have to test it. You're just doing it manually. So um, testing is something that I really believe in. And we took, I think, quite a sophisticated approach when it came to testing. We don't do 100% code coverage. We're not those types. I actually think if you have 100% code coverage, you've gone too far because what's happened is your tests have become so brittle because they're so tightly bound to the implementation of what you've written that any any change is going to just break lots of tests and that's not great you want to be able to kind of change your internals while the behavior's remaining the same and then therefore that not breaking the tests so it seems counterintuitive, but I would say 100% code coverage is a anti-goal, should not be something we shoot for. In fact, we don't count code coverage because we don't find it to be particularly useful. In some contexts, it is, right? If you've got a little package that's doing uh, string manipulation and you know every case it has to support, maybe that's different. For an application like this, 100% code coverage would kill productivity. We have unit testing where it makes sense. Uh, notice here, not every file has its own accompanying test file. Um, and again, that would be an alarm bell to some people. But that's because we've been very selective about where the testing is um, and what testing is appropriate for different parts of this. We have this app URL parsing thing. So if in Pace you paste a link to a comment uh, or a, a, a card or a piece of work, what we do is we notice it's a Pace URL and we, we parse it and we turn it into something that looks nicer. You know, we go and get the title of the card and put that in so that it's a nice experience. Well, that, that sort of operation is perfect for unit testing. We know the inputs and outputs that we expect so we can write code like this. So you can see that we've got this. This is the URL for a card uh, for URL unfurling. Uh, it has a card ID there. And I've got then a method I'm calling. And then I'm making some assertions about what I get out of that. So it's a kind of true unit test. And we're literally calling the method that we're going to be calling. So it's nice. By the way, this is, is a... Um, Testify. It's like a mini version of Testify. Um, Testify is a testing framework in Go, but it's massive. It has a lot. It does a lot, and so uh, is is a kind of minimalist version of Testify. Um, so I recommend using something like is. It just has a handful. If you look at the API, it has a handful of methods rather than you know eighty. I don't know how many Testify has, but it's it's a lot. It might even be 80. I was joking, but I don't know. Um, okay, so it, it, this is essentially making assertions about the outputs, as you'd expect. Um, and so we do have this kind of testing, and I can run these tests. In fact, these tests do get run as well when we deploy, uh, and they're, but they're a different kind of test. 
but they're good. They're good to have, and sometimes they're perfect. The other type of test we have is um, uh, what's probably more of an integration test to our API. So what we do is we spin up our uh, service, the API service, with a Firestore emulator. So this is what spins up locally on my development machine. Um, again, we both have the same machine, so we don't have other problems to deal with that you do have legitimately when you have more people. Um, I recommend looking at Docker test, by the way, something I discovered recently, which is an, a good way to achieve this if you don't have the same machine that you're developing on, the whole team. But we do. So we spin up this emulator, we spin up the API services, and we actually generated one of the other templates we have here is a Go client for our services. So this is literally, if we if we can decode this, you can see that this is actually Go code, kind of, that's going to make real a real HTTP request to uh, to the service. And then it decodes the body, and you see that everything's strongly typed still, look, because we're going to use the, the proper output object type name here as the response. So um, so this, this creates a client which is strongly typed. So the nice thing is, if I go into here and find our comments service, I can do comment service dot and... I have the I have the help in the IDE. Notice it looks like very similar to the the server code that was generated. It actually isn't the same, although they, I think the interfaces are identical, because um, you know I still want to use the same strong types. If I add the comment here, I'm I have to pass in an add comment request. I will get back an add comment response. So I'm now in here writing test code using strong type, strongly typed client that I generated from those same auto definitions that's generated the server code and the, the JavaScript client code, um, I get to do that in a familiar way and really become a user of the API in the same way that the, the, the web front end is a user. There is an extra piece that allows me to specify the which user I want to impersonate and you can't have that in the web API one. That would be a massive security problem. So I have it here just for um, uh, just for ease. We can we can do we can break our own we can break the rules because this is internal code. You see, and I'm just writing test code like here. I'm create a card. I check there's no error. I'm passing the org and the team that I want to create the card in. I pass a title. When it's successful. After I've checked there's no error that's come back, I grab the card ID, and here then I go and add files to that card. Um, I'm getting the org here, making sure that the, the storage used was updated as I was adding files. You know, I'm actually writing code and thinking things through as a real user. And that is a great way to... Um, have an automated way of being sure that your API is behaving as you want it to behave. If I were to nip in somewhere and break something, which I'm more than more than prepared to do, uh, let me just return an error here unexpectedly. Um, I think I can do that. Oh, that's complaining because this is now unreachable. Let's see if that's just a lint error or, oh no, I deployed it. Don't worry. See, I just did make deploy there and that could have been disastrous if I didn't have test coverage. You see how nervous I'd be in the terminal if I didn't have these tests protecting me? I wouldn't, <laughs> I'd be so careful about everything I typed. I don't need to. I can just be like, yeah, deploy. I've made a mess, deploy it. And it just won't, luckily. <laughs> Okay, so what's going to happen is this will run to that point. When it hits the point in that test where it was trying to update a comment, that's going to fail. Um, I, I suppose you don't really need to see this fail to believe me. These tests are running. Um, we normally run these tests in parallel, but um, 
we were working on something and we took it out. That's why these tests are, are being slow. Okay, I can't be bothered to wait for it. Uh, I'll just abort it and take this out. Get the idea. It's tested um, because <laughs> this will at some point call update service. And if any, e even if the fields are wrong that we get back, it'll fail. If there's an error, of course, it's going to fail. Uh, and sometimes we want errors back. And again, just like you write normal Go code, you know, it's easy. If if we if I left the title empty when I add a, a comment, um, and that was an error, then I could assert that that error is what came back. See what I mean? So you can actually uh, properly write good, strongly typed test code for for the service. And when it's deployed, we know. Uh, that it's it's going to be um, done in a kind of safe way. The final thing I want to show off is how we do this background work. One of the other key parts of this, you know, it is dead simple. It's just um, the user does something in the browser. The browser makes a call through Oto to our back end. The back end does the work. Did I show a proper implementation of a, a service? Because if not, I will. Let me find uh, the comment service and we'll just find add comment. So we check, we get the we get the current user here. This is this is the implementation code. So notice this isn't this wasn't generated for me. I still have to, that'd be good, wouldn't it? If it just generated the actual implementation as well. And you just have to write go interfaces. One day we'll get there. Until then, we have to write the implementations annoyingly. So um, you can see it does some basic things. It checks to make sure that the user has permission. Um, it's doing some work there for files. Eventually, it creates this comment entity and uses the store to put that comment entity at this particular place. And we use Firestore here. This is a slight abstraction we have over the store because sometimes a fire, a, 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 an operation, because it's a remote service, you know, that can sometimes fail. In fact, all things can sometimes fail and we sort of expect it to um, and we design around it. And so this little abstraction we have for the store, if we try and put a record and that fails for whatever reason, the, the API lets you decide whether it's a temporary error or if in fact, you know, it was malformed or something. If it was just a temporary error, we just have a little back off in that store that just tries again. So the net result is when this returns here, as long as it returns with no error, as long as it returns nil, that's been successful. It may have tried a few times there. So that's quite nice, uh, little things like that. And we only added that after we had a few times when it was failing. Um, you know, we, we don't try and abstract all this stuff too early. You know, for example, um, getting the current user ID and checking that they're in the org, that's something we do in probably 95% of the cases. So you could put that into a middleware. The problem is there are a couple of times when we don't do that. And so we would actually would rather just copy and paste this. You, you will notice it's kind of is the same in almost all of them. Um, programmers will naturally, that, that feels wrong. We want to dry that up. But actually, it's it's better sometimes to leave it because it's explicit. Like if I come to add comment and all it's doing is the comment things, I might be surprised by the, by some behavior because maybe I'm, I'm not, I don't have permission and I'm getting strange errors. I can't see that here. So one advantage to just having everything out like this, obviously these are method calls to other services. So it's not the, it's not the actual detail of it, but having those layers of abstractions hide things and you have to then go and find it a bit like the pyramid from the talk before you know you don't it's hard to see that shape when you're looking just in the, in the detail uh, so what you can do whatever you can do to help yourself your future self then you should do it and that, that, that's what we do um once this is all done we return the strong type. There you go. So that that's the thing. The other interesting thing is when you comment on something in Pace, we want to let other people know that you've commented. 
you know, there might be other people interested in a piece of work for whatever reason. Um, if we did that immediately, it means what would happen is you type in the comment, press enter, and you'd see the little loader for ages because it's going to not only put the comment in the data store, it's going to have to go and load all the people that are interested from the target, the thing you're commenting on. It's going to have to iterate through them and create records for them to notify them. If there's a hundred people or even a thousand people interested, that is just not okay. You can't ask the user to wait when you post a comment. It's a bit, it'd be like doing a tweet. And then the more followers you have, the longer you have to wait after a tweet because it's going to go and update all the followers. By the way, that is how Twitter works. Um, it does, in fact, do that. But of course, it does it asynchronously. It does it in the background. And that was the other major thing that we needed. App Engine has a PubSub service, so we're able to use that. And we have a slight abstraction um, over couple of bits and pieces. Slight abstractions that we added after the fact. Um, again, strongly typed here, we get to just say, um, publish this inbox item deliver. This is the operation that tells everyone, uh, updates everyone that a comment has been made. Um, this will literally just post to the PubSub API and return. So even this is quick. We, we still do them asynchronously because in this case, look, we, we, we update the search index at the same time as well. And then we have a set, our set of pub sub handlers that we saw earlier. And um, here we have uh, the, actually it's the inbox service has the deliver. Now what's happening is we, we issue that message We'll say this comment's been created, so we need to deliver this update. Um, the App Engine pub sub will actually take that, and the way it works, because it's HTTP, it will essentially make an HTTP request to the URL that we we told it to use, which is going to, through the routing, is going to line up to this particular method. So that's the flow. It goes from the PubSub service, it hits a real endpoint in our service. We then uh, go and do the work. And this is a background task, so it can. It, it's, there isn't a user waiting for this to happen. This can take up to, I think, 10 minutes or something. Um, so, you know, again, you may decide to do batching and things if, if operations are going to take longer than 10 minutes. They're not taking longer than 10 minutes, so we haven't done that. But this then speaks HTTP. If you return an error, it'll retry. So it's quite cool that uh, if our one of our comments just fails to get delivered for whatever reason, I mean, things fail all the time in computers, so that will happen sometimes. The PubSub operation will try again. And because we designed our systems to be idempotent, which is essentially means no matter how many times you apply that operation, the end result is the same as if you just applied it the once. So a very important concept, it turns out. Because of that, we don't mind if a, if something fails. Uh, it, it, the system will just retry. We aren't going to be delivering multiple times to people because the way we designed it. Um, so if it's already been delivered, it's, it, it's just a kind of no-op. It won't look like uh, it's been delivered again. So given that design, we, we then don't mind if these things happen. In fact, we expect them to. And it becomes kind of self-healing. If if there are mistakes that happen, because the things retry, or maybe um, it's it's a lower priority and you don't, don't really have to retry, maybe it's okay if it fails. That's another one where if you tell that to a product person, this are, you know, it's fine if this fails. They will not agree with that. That does not sound sensible. But actually, if you think about a conversation happening with lots of comments, if one of those comments failed to alert somebody then and, and there's a conversation happening, the next comment might well be, be successful. And so most of the time you're okay. So it's, it's kind of that strange sort of thinking of like, probably we're going to be okay with this. This is probably okay and probably good enough. That um, becomes very common thinking because it's sort of, it's about living in the real world, really. Um, of course, we do everything we can to make 
make it work every time, but <laughs> it's computers, it doesn't. And I think that's essentially it. I'll give a quick uh, summary of of what I was of what I've gone through today. Um, so yeah, we keep everything we can as simple as possible to the point where other experienced Go programmers would potentially look at it and say, "No, you're doing this wrong because you know you you can you might have these problems in the future." Well, yeah, we might have them in the future. We don't have them today, and that's when we're building these things. So um, we do defer a lot uh, problem, technical problems and hard things. You know, it's a, it, it's a kind of balancing act. If you do that too much, you can get yourself in trouble. Um, but I think done in the right way, it's it's such a nice approach because everything's simple. And then that the knock-on effect of that is it just keeps paying dividends again and again because it's simple. And then you you make things more complex when you need to. Um, yeah, it's worth saying we are a tiny team. So having said that, this is how I've worked in bigger organizations, but just broken teams into smaller teams and then kind of worked like this. But there are challenges and different things you have to care about as you add people and as you add customers and things, you know. Um, things do change and evolve. And that's part of the point is that that's what you expect. And that's the time to make the decisions because you've got all the context, you know. Trying to imagine those structures up front, I find to be fun, but often you're wrong. Off, very often you're wrong. So maybe don't do it yet. Um, rolling your own components gives you absolute control. Uh, you do have to be careful. You can't just do, you know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, you want to make sure that you are using your time wisely. But when you have absolute control of something, you can make it do exactly what you need it to do and do that really well. I love our our blog, the way our blog looks and works. Uh, it doesn't have anything in there that we don't want in there. Um, and there's something nice about that control that you can have if you really care about every pixel. And again, it's a point of privilege. Not everyone's in the, that position. Um, our structure is flat and boring. It's just a folder full of Go files, but it completely works. The we've, we've got a lot of code in there and the IDE has not slowed down. None of the tooling's getting slower. Um, running the tests then was the slowest they've ever run. Usually it flies through them. Um, and that's because we turned off the parallel processing bit. Um, so yeah, flat structures and keeping things simple, but expect it to evolve. And when when you learn, oh, this isn't right, it's not that you were wrong before. That's another thing. Like we feel, I think, especially junior developers, you feel like this, we learned later that this was the wrong way to do it. Therefore, we should never have done it. And that's wrong. Um, you know, we, we can't predict the future. You probably did the right thing at the time. Um, the fact that you changed it after is really only possible because of the journey you took. So we have to not be too hard on ourselves with those things. And in team environments, you've got to have a, a culture that allows for this because this is how software development happens. Um, I'm never very impressed when somebody says, uh, this is exactly how we need to do it. I, you know, this is how it's the only way to do it. It's This is the right way to do it. None of that's ever really true. There aren't really right and wrong ways. Um, it's 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 much more complicated than that, and the same thing applies for our working practices too. Uh, occasionally, we we will break work up and work on it independently. Mostly, we pair a lot, we pair almost exclusively, but sometimes we break it up and do it. So we're kind of flexible and relaxed, and that's kind of an approach that allows us to be quite rapid um, in in our engineering. Thank you very much indeed. I would love to hear some questions if there are any. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks for the very detailed walkthrough. Mm, 
And uh, indeed, two questions on the uh, comments box. Maybe you can just bring it up quickly. Mm -hmm. um, one is on Octo. Right. So that's Octo. Yeah. Okay. So the question is Does Otto uh, employ a binary uh, protocol? And the answer actually is no, not yet. Uh, at the moment, we have this Oto HTTP component, which is uh, actually a JSON HTTP implementation. But what's interesting is because they're templates, uh, it's very easy for us to change this. Actually, in this case, because of the this package, we could add a binary um, and probably will, maybe will. The reason we haven't so far is because we like in the browser to be able to just go and have a look at the data that comes out like this. Um, you know, we, we, we can click around and debug it and uh, even make requests in a very easy, familiar way. So we're still in that phase of this. I think as this is running and as more customers come on board, we may find that there's some savings to be had, may find, by doing something like that. Probably the, the, there isn't a, a great deal of overhead in marshalling and unmarshalling of JSON in this kind of system. If you think about it, it's rare that people are going to be clicking loads. <laughs> but at scale, our intention is to measure. We measure a lot. We measure what's happening and where time is being spent, and then we'll go and tackle those problems. So if indeed we're spending a lot of time just marshalling and unmarshalling JSON, then the next thing that a little project for us would be to add a binary support. You could even add gRPC to Oto, by the way, and just use, because you can generate thing, anything really, um, and just use the Go interfaces to define it. You probably wouldn't do that, but um, those options are open to us because we control it. And the design of Oto really was of was that, so that you you take the templates and, and do what you want to do with those templates. So anybody could contribute if they wanted to. This is an open source project, by the way, uh, a binary version of this. Um, and it might be something we do as a, like we might just stream it and build it just for sort of fun because it's quite a fun thing to do, but... So no, it's it's actually for, for the reasons I've talked about HTTP JSON because it's familiar, it's simple, and it's good enough for now. But we can improve it later if we want to. Okay, thank you, Matt. The last question is this: uh, about templates. So how do we check that templates being used are going to generate real valid code? Um, and yes, what's the process of that? Well, the process is, if, if I show you our make file, in particular, the, the, the Go code is a good example because we have, the, we have Go Fumpt. So what's nice about this is I can use the auto command to generate the, the server. Actually, it's this server file that I showed earlier. And then I Go Fumpt it. And that, that not only formats the the code but actually if there's any errors in there it reports the errors too so you you are um getting quite early feedback getting a quite early feedback loop there um and then yeah then it's a case of after that it's about then the testing making sure that the testing works but because these are strong types you almost can't go wrong because you get compile errors. In fact, they happen in the IDE. I'm not joking. If I go into this comments and added uh, monkey as a, a method, copy these types. If I then uh, do my gen auto, generate the auto service, you can straight away see, look, there's a problem. And the problem is, it's trying to use this comments service where it, it shouldn't be allowed. Um, because of this, it's missing the monkey field. So it turns into a compile time exercise and you can't get it wrong. It's cool. 
as far as implementation goes, of course, we rely then on our testing and our tests to check things. But again, our tests aren't checking the implementations really. You know, they're just using it as an API. They're saying, create this card, give me the card ID. Now add a file, get the card. You know, they're talking in, the, in those terms. If we changed how we did that in the server, these tests wouldn't break. They just keep working, hopefully. Okay. Now I'm, I removed the, the monkey field. I have to just generate the other things again. Yeah, and I think we're back to normal. I've got some spelling mistakes now. We'll worry about that later. Are there any other questions? No, I think that's about all. Yeah, thank you, Matt, for for spending time with us. Thanks for inviting right. me. Um, I, I I love the fact one of the as we were saying earlier, one of the nice things about lockdown is we get to take part in conferences like this that wouldn't yeah. be possible. Although I do want yeah. to come to Singapore as soon as possible, of course. Yes, if you do come, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Yeah. Yes, and I'll come. I'll come to the meetup in real per real life. How about that? Okay, and also thank you, Sao Xiong, again for staying through also uh, for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, last but not least, uh, thank you to all who stayed throughout uh, for this Saturday evening. Uh, we have one more in July. Uh, let's want to do this every month. And lastly, I want to show the uh, feedback uh, page that uh, encourage you to also submit your feedback for today's session. This is the QR code and also the link. Uh, we will paste a link as well in the YouTube channel comments and you can just directly do it from there. All right. If not, uh, we'll leave this on for a while and uh, thank you again to the community for coming. That's all for this June edition. Thank you very much. And